welcome to our vampire bat cave. This is where all the booty kicking goes down. Five, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven. Some bad newborn vampires are gonna try to get us in this movie. And, uh, they're not like little newborns. That would be really ridiculous if we were fighting babies. <laughs> so uh, we have to do some battle. We were here for about two weeks before we even started production. Seven. Getting us into shape. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this one because I knew that training would be involved. It's been a very physical, intense preparation. I, I don't even know what you would call it. It's fight, they call it fight training. My name is Jonathan Eusebio. I'm involved in designing fight sequences and training the actors. For us, choreography-wise, we just make sure everything's based off speed and movement. So a lot of debating how to punch for camera. You're supposed to fake the punches. Yeah, the physicality of it is what you want to get. It's a lot of strength meets cardio, and it's really hard. I've almost thrown up a few times, I'm not gonna lie. We have the giant hamster wheel over here. Can you get that? They put like a piece of cheese up there, and then we all run, try to get the cheese. And over there is where we do all of our uh, kicks and swings and, and, and fighting each other. Jumping around and trying new things, beating each other up. I grew up having brothers, so I know self-defense. I know kicking butt. We're getting into sick, crazy shape. It's, uh, it's good times. Well, we have about one week left on shooting, and we are in the studio. There's a lot of green screen action, and right now they built a giant type of family like treadmill. These guys are actually having to get up on uh, treadmills and run as fast as they physically can. One of the toughest things is we're doing these stunts, and yet you still have to be in character, versus the human, any who wants to huff and puff and gather air, us vampires don't need that. They were competing with each other as to who runs faster. I guess I was uh, like four knots higher than everyone else, and then Nikki Reed was uh, the closest to my speed. But I beat everyone, which is awesome. We really haven't been practicing and training for marathons like we're doing here, but all the training we've been doing definitely pays off. Now I can walk down the block without feeling winded, so uh, thank you, Eclipse, for getting me in shape and, and, and teaching me how to pretend kick people's butts. If I ever uh, get into trouble, I'll know how to pretend to kick someone's butt. I've decided to throw a party. After all, how many times are we gonna graduate high school? A party at your place? I've never seen your house. No one's ever seen their house. In Twilight, the Cullen House was a practical location found outside of Portland. Now, fast forward to Eclipse, there's a lot more work that takes place in the Cullen House itself. So we knew that we couldn't consolidate everything into one room and cheetah like we did on New Moon. So we made the decision to build the structure right to the detail of the TNG cedar roofing underneath the overhangs to the floor to ceiling glass. I mean, right to the nth degree. If the owners of the original house walked into this house, they would be astonished by the fact that their house was suddenly inside a building. Well, here we are, we're outside the Cullen house. We've got the Cullen forest here, it's all real. The green skies put forests everywhere around this place. And you can see behind it, there's a big photographic print. So between the two, especially for a night scene, it should sell it. We're gonna walk right up the front steps and we have a lot of fake things here. Fake rocks, lots of them. All the stuff that looks like concrete is really just paint, painted wood with a little, very thin veneer of concrete, and we'll go on, we'll go on in. 
because it's such a fan base of the Twilight series, all the little details that are written in the book one has to take into account when we're designing the sets. Often it's colors. Stephanie's written lots of things about certain colors. For instance, the party. It's written that uh, there's twinkly lights, red and purple lights decorating the party. We've kept all that. There's quite a collection of uh, artifacts from various places in the world. This is some Japanese prints. We've got a little Japanese gar rock garden outside here. There's an old calligraphy instruments right here. It was actually an interesting challenge because a lot of it was kind of like archaeology. You had to dig back through the footage from the first movie, footage from the second movie, and then try to put your own mark on it and bring your own uh, ideas into the third movie. We're coming up to the main level of the house. Uh, we figure, you know, it's interesting they have a bug collection, butterflies, different kind of bugs, and we'll, we'll take you into the living room right here. As you can see, they've got modern sculptures, they've got Asian art, they've got old mixed with new furnishings. When we have floor-to-ceiling windows like this, you can shoot outside and see the driveway and everything else out there. There's a narrow little window in the living room, which is really great. It's a great view. It's, it becomes like a modern art piece with this rock wall outside. We'll go this way. On the way up, you can see some, there's some pieces from the first movie. And of course, as you pan up around the corner here, there's the uh, graduation caps from the first Twilight as well. So we brought that back. It's a little crowded in here, but we're coming into the dining room. Oh, this, this piece is sort of an interesting piece. It, it's a rubbing from a piece of plywood with the marks are all from porcupines chewing it, and I thought it was a, a good little piece to put up there. Nice and modern, different. Here's the kitchen. I mean, this is, the cabinets are all real wood, but as you can see, it wouldn't be very good to uh, entertain here, because, see, nothing's real. <laughs> These open, but there's nothing inside. Interesting left, there's a bunch of little photos around the place. They're all from the director's fiance, so that's an interesting little tidbit. It's always a bit of a sad day when you get to the end of filming. In this case, it all has to carefully get taken apart. All the set dressing has to be labeled, itemized, stored away for the next movie. When Breaking Dawn comes around in theory, it all gets pulled out of storage. All the drawings are pulled out, and guys have to piece it all back together again in this studio or maybe some other studio. We wanted the scope and, and the scale of shooting on this amazing mountaintop where Edward makes their camp. Uh, but we're shooting in the fall. There's obviously no snow up there. It's also a national park, so you can't put fake snow up there. So we built the entire mountaintop on stage and dressed it with the snow that we would need for the sequence. The studio space, of course, limits us to how much of the, the uh, mountaintop we could use. So that is how we sort of created this bowl where the tent is and put it inside the stage and basically recreated that. I've never actually done uh, that kind of scale of exterior set indoors before. We had probably 50 people working on construction, painters and uh, greensmen. And then of course the snow effects guys had to come in as well and snow everything over in the last three days. We were really pressed for time, but we actually, everyone pulled together and managed to get it done. I have to say, our set doesn't quite match. Um, the savior is when we, we see them prior to entering the, the tent, they go in before snow and we have a big snowfall and then we come out into a nice crisp day right. and hopefully uh, it'll all blend together at that point. We could then control the snow, we could control the light, we could control the weather and we could then spend three weeks shooting the final conflict between Victoria and Edward which required extensive amount of stunt work and wire work. It's sort of this incredible feat was accomplished, just building this, this amazing set so that we could film a very arduous, very complex sequence without having to be exposed to the elements of Vancouver weather in late October. <laughs> Isabella Swan, I promise to love you every moment of forever. Would you do me the extraordinary honor of marrying me? Yes. Bella's engagement ring, it shouldn't look like the ring that you want to go out and get tomorrow. Uh, this ring should look old fashioned. It should look out of date. It should look unusual and kind of make you stop and say, oh, you know, that's an engagement ring. It's, it's different. Basically, the ring was built in four different attempts. This is the first ring that was, was built, um, which was our first attempt. However, once they saw this, they felt it was too large and a little bit too much like a school class ring. So we moved on to the second ring and the third ring at the same time because we were in a bit of a time crunch. We ended up having one built in Portland and one built in Vancouver. Of the two, they were happy with them but weren't exactly sold that that was the perfect ring for Bella. 
So what we ended up doing is having a conversation with Stephanie Meyer, who then drew us a little sketch of the ring that they ended up finally building. And this gives you an example of, of basically what they started with. From there, they saw the wax cast and said that they wanted diamonds throughout, more of a pave style setting. And this is the final result. And that's how we got to that. So there it is, 14 karat white gold with 69 different cubic zirconians in a pave style setting. I was really excited with what came out of it because it looks exactly right. And I've seen other attempts that came close that looked similar to what was described, but this one was spot on. And so I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Are these all our old trip t-shirts? Mm-hmm. Get out. I saved them all. I thought they'd make a good quilt. Keep you warm up in Alaska. And here's a look at something else that's very neat from the movie. This is the quilt that Bella's mom gives to Bella in Florida. What we did to start out was we started contacting real companies that we thought had unique, interesting looking t-shirts. So we had a graphic designer design the t-shirt, then we had a t-shirt company print them for us, then we cut them all out and then had them all stitched together and this is what we ended up with. This is the one that they reference in dialogue, Saul's Snake and Taqueria. This is the uh, three-headed lobster in Maine. This one here was designed by a friend of the director. Each t-shirt was acquired and then broken down and aged. Then we selected the backing color of purple because that's Bella's favorite color. The quilt was built fairly thin so that we could get into a small box for the shooting. So basically, by the time this quilt was completed, by the time we phoned around, found the t-shirts, got them all delivered, paid for them, cut them, sewed them, this was probably roughly 400 hours of work went into this quilt, and there's three of them in existence at this point right now. <laughs>